Welcome to Before After Omo. This is our sixth episode in which we follow Chizo Matsumoto's exploration of new religion. Episode 1 covered the historical context for the increase of cults in Japan, which informs today's episode, so I do encourage you to listen to that. Episodes 2 to 5 covered Shoko Asahara's early years. His birth name is Chizo Matsumoto, which is what he went by at this point. So we will use that name until he changes it, which, spoiler, happens at the end of this episode. I am Atsushi Sakahara, a filmmaker based in Kyoto, Japan, and I'm a survivor in the Saringas attack took place in 1995, Tokyo. I'm Pearl Chan. I'm a film and birth worker based in Hong Kong. Before we start today, I wanted to ask you to please rate and review our podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen. We work very hard on bringing you the truth about the terrible cult and Shoko Asahara. Please support us with a few minutes of your time. Thank you. As with the last few episodes, our research relies heavily on the work of Fumihiko Takayama's book, Birth of Asahara, Asahara Shoko no Tanjo in Japanese, which has not been translated from Japanese to English yet. Last we left Chizuo, he had just been fined 200,000 yen and was detained for 20 days for selling, or rather, falsely advertising drugs without permission under the Japanese drug law. He closed down his clinic, BMA, the Buddhist Messiah Association, and is in financial straits. He has two baby daughters at home. Until now, we've spoken mostly about the facts of his secular life until 1982. But now we're going to delve into his interest into new religions, which backtracks our timeline a little bit. Okay, I have to say that I'm really excited for this episode because we're finally getting back into new religions, into cults, and all the weird, weird, weird stuff. <laughs> If you are a, a, a victim, you are a victim. You're not a journalist. So, this is a very good thing. Chizu's fascination with religious practice began under his older brother's influence. He was the one who recommended Chizu to read literature from Soka Gakkai and Agonshu. We introduced Soka Gakkai and Agonshu in our first episodes, if you want to go back and listen to that. He, his interest was more in fortune telling, focused on the four pillars of fortune telling in Chinese culture. Right, so this is Bazi, a form of fortune telling based on people's births, including hour, day, month, and year, and what it means in terms of elements and the Chinese animal zodiac. People can take this pretty seriously and is used often for when people want to get married and they compare the people who are about to get married's batsi to see if they're compatible. How do you use it in Japan? We use the same thing, you know, when you、uh, are going to get married or when you start dating or whatever it is and you check it, right? Just in case they check it. And then <laughs> it would be funny. Just in case it was bad. <laughs> What do they do? I don't know. Popular is also, you call, you call yeah, it. Yeah, so、Bazi? it literally means the eight letters, so the, or the eight words. So that's the, the, two, you know, the two words for the hour of your birth, the two numbers of the date, the month, and the year.、Ah. And, what it, and so、ah. together. But, so then, popular is we call it shichu suime. And、uh, there is one female、uh, fortune teller with shichu suime, popular. Uh, fortune telling technique. And、uh, she was so influential in Japan. And she is still. And、uh, I think、uh, she makes fortunes. And then also, I don't really like, you know, understandably, because I am a survivor in the Omu. She was not involved in Omu, but it's sort of spiritual, right? But the many TV stations broadcasted、uh, her. Because people watch it, right? Her name is Hosoki Kazuko. She's very well known. 
So she makes predictions like every like New Year or something? Mm, no, more like, you know what, in one of the TV stations, she met one comedian and suggested、uh, to him that he should change his name. And he changed his name. And he changed his name again, I think. And she charges quite a lot of money for fortune telling. And basically, I heard the rumor or I, maybe an article. She suggested that, oh, you should go to the graveyard and、uh, start cleaning them, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or maybe you need a new graveyard or you, you need a, a very good order, you know? Something like that. And that's also, I think, a part of our business, you know? You know what? I don't. They are using the、uh, true weakness of.、Mm-hmm. And we'll get there in this episode about weakness. Yes, so he studied this from China.、Um, and later in his book, The Secret Method of Superpower Development, he would like to talk about this time period as being one where he devoted himself to becoming a sendo. Sendo, as the Japanese call it, Sinyan in Chinese, is a person who has achieved immortality. Essentially, it means you are a fairy or deity. One of the most famous people who devoted their lives to becoming a Sendo by being a devoted practitioner of Taoism is the poet Li Bai, which, if you've ever gone to Chinese school, would be the person who wrote the one poem everyone has to recite Night Thoughts. Really? Taoism is very. Well, respect in the total. Yeah,、school. so this is the one poem that、um, in like America or Canada on Saturdays, Chinese, ch- Chinese children have to go to Chinese school where they learn Chinese.、Um, and one of the very basic things they teach you is the Li Bai poem, Night Thoughts. Ja- did you know that the Japanese really he, he loves to uh, uh, read、uh, Chinese philosophy and th- thought? Really? And Chizu wanted to change his fate. He wanted to control his destiny. He thought he could do this by achieving the impossible and、uh, having superpowers, becoming a super person. And more, more than person, a fairy or a deity. I think, you know what?、Uh, I think, yeah. You know what? I don't know if he wanted to、uh, change his fate, but, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he wanted to change his fate. But I think he wanted to be a superman or superpower, right? But that's changing your fate, right? He was born with a pretty that, that, bad、right. hand of c a r d s So、cards. I thought, yeah, when I read it for the first time, I think you're right. Yes. But I don't blame it, though.、Mm-mm. No, of course not. Around the, ta- around the time, you know. Around the time, it was sort of a boom, and then also I am a little much younger, but、uh, I was sort of crazy too. I, I told you, and I bought a book about how I can be、uh, much smarter, and then I put the plastic bag right in front of mouth and nose. Yeah, Atsushi, then... I was thinking about that again. Do you realize that you could have killed yourself? Yeah, if you can keep continuing. You won't keep continuing, right? Yeah, you suffocate, you、then、die. You keep doing it for good, yes. You're right. I, I understood too. <sighs> so crazy. But I was just trying to do it. But that was crazy. And then you start to stop. So, it,、right? so while you were trying to get the superpower of breathing through plastic to better utilize the blood to your brain, Chizuo was looking for different k i n d of superpowers. Four in particular.、Right. I was a little bit more sane, right? Well, I don't know. You're trying to you put a plastic <laughs> bag over your head, so I'm not so sure if you were more sane. <laughs> stupid <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I was stupid. But you know what?、Uh, around that age, you know, a teenager, right?、Oh, what a dumb I am. And how can I improve? You know, oh, maybe I read it. Oh, maybe I try. You know, doesn't cost me anything, right? You can sort of see the power that these kind of superpowers have on people, people like Hiroshi Araki. And so the four superpowers that Chizuo were looking for w a s one, to have his soul leave his body, two, to heal people with his hands, three, to see spirits, and four, to read minds. One person who claimed to have similar superpowers was Shinji Takahashi. 
So now we're going to jump into the God Light Association, another new religion of this era. God Light Association, GLA, was founded around 1971 by Shinji Takahashi. Shinji Takahashi claimed to experience his soul leaving his body for the first time when he was 10 years old. He would call this other self his astral self and began exploring the reasons behind the experience. Instead of first turning to religion, he turned to physics and engineering to find proof of his experience. Other sources claim that he had spiritual anxiety and visited a number of temples, shrines, churches, mosques, and other religious places after returning from the Second World War. As an adult, he claimed to be in conversation with two spirits who he later identified as Jesus, who was acting as his guardian spirit, and Moses, who was acting as his guiding spirit. He claimed to have performed miracles such as exorcism by teaching disharmonious spirits about cosmic law and attained Buddhahood. His teachings are focused on a universal cosmic law on which all religions, according to him, are based on a certain fundamental truth. He began, he began preaching first in his home, then later in Tokyo. In 1971, a follower of Zuhukai, another new religion, heard his lecture and was so taken by it that eventually Zuhukai merged with GLA, forming what is called GLA Kansai. Zuhukai was already a religious corporation, which we'll get into in a later episode, but essentially it means that they are recognized as a religion for tax purposes, so GLA also gained this religious corporation status. Around the time that Shizuo would have found GLA, there was a change in leadership when Takahashi died in 1978 and his 19-year-old daughter Keiko took over. GLA Kansai rejected Keiko and continues to use videotapes of Takahashi Sr. for lectures, whereas Keiko Takahashi focuses on what she calls spiritual counseling, a rhetorical session on stage, personality tests, and lectures. I found this kind of interesting when I was reading about it, but essentially it's, you know, as if you in the audience are going through a counseling session and she'll talk to you and, and try and like counsel you through something, but really it's like a way for her to monologue her own ideas. Anyways, I just found it kind of interesting. Sort of the, you know, the, how can I, coaching or something, in a psychological session, right? Yeah, but really she knows exactly what she wants to be talking about and she just needs someone to prompt her. So really, like, your problems don't matter. <laughs> it's not very good counseling. I mean, maybe it works for you, but, you know. No, no. Not very no. personal. We can see some of the same veins in what Chizuo wanted in terms of these superpowers, but also that Takahashi ran a successful business alongside the religious organization. And we've talked about this previously, that Chizuo wanted both a secular and spiritual life. He wanted to attain enlightenment, and he wanted to play with his kids. Takahashi claimed to be able to separate his body and soul, heal and exorcise people by speaking with spirits. He didn't seem to have claimed to be a mind reader, but otherwise it's easy to see how Chizuo was interested. But it's not GLA that he joined, but Agonshu. He joined Agonshu in August 98 and was an active member at the time of his arrest in 1982. We previously mentioned his involvement in Agonshu and talked about Agonshu in episode 1. In Agonshu, he became incredibly focused on developing his superpowers, and Agonshu's leader, Kiriyama's book, uh, is uh, uh, I can uh, explain about the book. His name is the book is called the Ultimate Method to Develop Superpower. Basically, it says, uh, you can become a Buddha with seven kinds of system and thirty-seven curriculum. That was the sort of the uh, they're pushing, and basing on the Buddhism mysticism, that is from the later stage of the Mahayana Buddhism. You know Mahayana Buddhism. You know, that's for everybody to help everybody, right? Not to be to help yourself, 
Buddhism, right? So can you believe that in, you can become a Buddha with seven kinds of system and 37 kinds of curriculum, right? You know what? When I visited the Omo, right? They have so many textbooks and steps. You can become a basically a sen, sen, sento, sendo or senin in Japanese, right? You follow this approach. It's like a test prep, you know what I'm saying? It's scary. Japan was like this, you know. Around the time, you know, Chizu went to the Yoyogi seminar, the test franchise, a very big uh, test prep, right? And I did too, right? And Japan was like this, you know. It's like a, always a methodology, and uh, I am a good at methodology too, but uh, methodology and then also the steps. This is how you do, right? So that's why we don't have a creativity, I think, personally. <laughs> Kiriyama's philosophy was a mix of mysticism and the prophecies of Nostradamus, both of which evidently had an influence on later Om Shinrikyo dogma. The good thing is the guy who introduced uh, uh, Nostradamus, I think I remember Goto or something, his last name is Goto. He's very old guy now, but about to recently he says that like, uh, I just he he just uh, made up things and wrote it in the book and uh, he's he sold a lot of books. That's why he animated, you know. <laughs> Funny, you know. And then yeah, so many people started being in Nostradamus, you know. Many young people who love the like uh, occult book, you know. If it's a true mysticism, probably it's okay, same, right? But it's sort of hybrid or it's okay, sort of... Yeah. The... While at Agonshu, Chizuo Matsumoto committed to a thousand days of practice, which required believers to meditate and contribute tithe every single day. So usually when you tithe, you get a mandala or a photo in return, but while you're doing the thousand days of, pa of practice and tithing, you get nothing in return, you know, except for enlightenment. So it's around this time that there is tension in the Matsumoto household. Chizuo's greatest struggle was to figure out how to balance home life and his spiritual commitment, and he started to divert funds away from his household to contributing mm -hmm. to Agonshu. Do you remember that he was blaming the way the Agonshu did the collecting money, right? He said, I think I remember, uh, he said that uh, I have to give money for the thousand day practice and, you know, I don't even get the pictures from them, right? Yeah. So, how shallow he could be, right? Mm -hmm. Does a picture matter, right? If you that's the religion, right? I mean, do you need a thousand pictures if you're practicing a thousand days? Right. <laughs> it's like a trade card, you know. Or or meaning do you count it, you know, do you really need it? If you are uh, practicing for your own good sake or happiness or whatever, for your mind, right? Yeah, but you know why? He wanted to be just superman, right? Superpower sendo he wanted to be. If you think of it in terms of judo, right? He wanted his black belt, and he didn't see he didn't see himself getting it. He he didn't get anything out of the practicing or whatever it is, and then he doesn't he didn't get that. Maybe he did get something, but uh, you know, it's he didn't feel he get something. And well, actually, I'm going to skip ahead since you mentioned that, but. You know, it's also during this time that he has his exploration of classical yoga using the Yoga Sutras. Uh, that's and right. he was that's he was right. frustrated with Agon Shu's lack of physical training and he began exploring yoga on his own. The Yoga Sutras were compiled sometime between 500 BCE and 400 CE by the sage Pantaldali in India who synthesized and organized knowledge about yoga from much older traditions. So he applied the same concentration he had in judo into yoga practice and working towards asceticism slash renouncing the world. So I think he was he was he was struggling at Agon Shu. He was he was finding it he was finding it difficult. And I think he was trying to stick with it by, you know, just doing this 
thousand days of practice. So this brings us back in line with our timeline of Chizuo being arrested on June 22, 1982. After the arrest, Chizuo fell into financial ruin. Later in the 1989 November-December issue of the Omo publication Mahayana, his wife Tomoko described this period of time like this. We were exposed to severe eyes from the outside because of the police. The eyes of the society were dreadful. We locked ourselves at home, even the children. When we had to leave for many years, we would keep our eyes down. Our phone line was disconnected and our intercom was turned off. We came oh we became reclusive from society for many years and even forgot how to converse naturally. I read this as the beginning of their paranoia, founded or unfounded. Uh I don't know it's paranoia but it sort of uh, it started the chain of reactions heading to where we see in our future, right? In this timeline. Yeah, and, and even the sarin gas attack the day of, which yes. of course we will talk about down the road, on that day, there's the reason why it happened earlier than initially they had planned was because it was because Asahara was afraid they would the police would, uh, Asahara was afraid that the police would raid their compound. That's very correct, but, <coughs> sorry, but that was far beyond the point of no return. You know, they killed many, some people already. It's just an example you of know, their paranoia. They did. Or example of like, right. of other examples of, of Asahara's paranoia. Yes, yes. Or, or yeah, or maybe it, I, th I feel like irreversible chain of reactions. After his 1,000 days of practice at Agonshu, or potentially because he could no longer afford the donations, and also because he found it limiting, he left Agonshu not long after his arrest. He would later say that his three years at Agonshu was spiritually detrimental. Agonshu, likewise, did not have nice things to say about Shizuo. After the sarin gas attack, Agonshu publicly denied Chizuo Matsumoto, then known as Shoko Asahara, had ever been part of Agonshu. This is from Ian Reader's book, Religious Violence in Contemporary Japan. Quote, Agonshu itself, after the subway attack, did as much as it could to distance itself from Asahara, initially denying that he had been a member, and when the denial was found to be incorrect, claiming that his membership records had inadvertently been misplaced. It further argued that he had been a member in name only and that he had not really participated in or followed Agonshu teachings or practices. Kiriyama himself wrote a book denouncing Asahara, denying that he had been a genuine member of the movement and arguing that, he, and arguing that if he had truly followed Agonshu's practices, he would never have taken the path he did. When I attempted to investigate the Asahara connection with Agonshu further in 1996, officials of the movement refused to speak to me or to meet me. It is clear, however, that there are substantial links between Agonshu's teachings and those developed in Ohm. While a number of Asahara's close followers, including Hayashi Ikuo, had originally been in Agonshu, end quote. Ikuo Hayashi is the one who started confessing, confessing confession to POP, Public Prosecutor's Office. And then he was not, the, I think he's the only one who was not executed for that. Because he, he made a confession and then uh, that helped the uh, law enforcement to proceed the legal procedure. In any case, in November that year, 1982, he meets Nishiyama. If you remember from episode 2, Nishiyama was a sort of mentor for Chizuo Matsumoto, with whom he shared stories of his childhood days. Fumihiko spoke to Nishiyama to learn about those early years, but also the year they spent together. Chizuo saw a job advertisement 
and, and went to the building for an interview.、Uh, the building had、uh, four companies listing, listed on it Nishiyama General Corporation, Nishiyama General Credit Corporation, Nishiyama Management Education Seminar, and the last one is a、uh, Jinen Shinkokai. Translated directly, it means acting with self belief organization. Nishiyama is a sort of difficult person to explain. He's originally from Hakata near Fukuoka and used to be a bouncer at a dance hall. He was known for winning at the races and started his company with a 14 million yen winning. If you look at the businesses, you can begin to understand. The Nishiyama Management Education Seminar was aimed at training pachinko managers. Pachinko is comparable to slots and exists as a loophole in Japan where gambling is technically illegal. Nishiyama General Corporation and Nishiyama General Credit Corporation were involved in real estate, and the Jinan Shinkokai, as Atsushi said, acting with self belief organization, was a semi religious spiritual organization. So he was a serial entrepreneur, but You ultimately think he's a good person, right? I, I, I guess so. He, but、uh, he, you know, everybody tries to protect, right? So, Chizuo arrives for his job interview in a suit, but no tie, still two work boots, and a big shoulder bag in which he carried an abacus, which is pretty odd, right? Don't you think? It's very odd. You know, abacus. <laughs> and,、uh, <laughs> with the book, sh- the boots, you know, for the like,、uh, construction workers, right? Yeah. And then during the interview,、uh, Chizuo starts talking about his childhood and his time with Mr. A. And、uh, he showed a, a picture of Mr. A to Nishiyama. And all in all, the interview went、uh, pretty poorly. And at one point, Nishiyama hands Chizo back his resume, you know, indicating that he would not have the job. And, but, you know, we are not, although we are not sure if the Chizo got, got on the hint or u n d e r s t a n d the hint, you know, but Chizo left. Uh, Nishiyama's anyway. But five, year, five days later, Chizuo visits Nishiyama when he is having a dinner. He rings the doorbell and Nishiyama's wife answers, telling him that, that there is a man at the door. By her expression or the way she spoke, Nishiyama realized it was Chizuo. And Chizuo asks Nishiyama, Can I be a student? And Nishiyama tells him, If you say so, please come during the day and sit in the lecture. But Chizuo didn't go for lectures. Instead, he continued to show up around dinner time. Nishiyama basically realized that Chizuo would come at night and talk to him, essentially because it wasn't a class and he didn't have to pay. At first, Nishiyama was moved by Chizuo's passion and let him visit at night. He felt sorry for Chizuo's childhood. In episode 2, we cover a lot of what Chizuo told Nishiyama about his childhood, if you are interested. When Nishiyama asked him what he wanted to be, Chizuo told him he wanted to be a politician. And Nishiyama asked him, How much money do you have? Chizuo answered, five or six hundred thousand yen. That is about maybe five thousand dollars. And, or six, yeah, or more or less. And so Nishiyama told him, You don't have money or power. I don't think you can be a politician. You can become a religious person and help those who are spiritually weak. You can go after them as if you were fishing. You can go after them as if you were fishing. 
Becoming a politician is like fishing whales in a river. Focus instead on weaker people. When he said this, Nishiyama thought he saw Chizuo's eyes twinkle. Nishiyama found that Chizuo's attitude changed after he showed him a little magic. You know? The magic is okay. I think it is a critical moment he wanted to learn magic. It's simple, but he, Nishiyama didn't tell the trick also. The magic is uh, grab the uh, uh, grab chopsticks on the dinner table, right? With the, with the little power. Somehow it turns into a sand in you know, in his palm, you know, on his palm, you know, and then he, the sand is uh, dropped on the table. I don't know how he did it. He didn't tell how he did it, but uh, that's what he showed it. Chizu asks Nishiyama to teach him the trick, really, really pesters him, you know, and, and finally he says to him, Nishiyama, are you human or are you an alien? If you do that, people will believe you are the real God. People will jump on you. Teach me. And Nishiyama thought, if I tell you, this will become a big issue since you will use it for religion. Please leave. I wonder if Nishiyama did teach him some magic tricks and then he's saying this to be like, oh. And then he says, he um, yeah, yeah maybe, later like, he says, I did, he didn't. But maybe he, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I think it's a, yeah, it's it's a, a little story bit too to much premonition. To, to, it could be. Yeah. We cannot blame, but it could yeah, be a I mean, story. Yeah, like it's a bit too to knowing him, to right? know that it's about Maybe it's gonna happen. True. I don't know, but you, you know why? Because uh, if he did teach, right? I think you did, and then I I did uh, fairly extensive research of the Om Shinrikyo. We might we might have heard that Asahara did this trick to someone else. He is the one. He is, in a sense, very smart. But he, he could be, in a sense, it's very dumb, right? He's dumb, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, he, but he also did tricks, right? Like, he did the trampoline flying trick, things like that. He, did, he, also, he also had some tricks to make people believe he was God. Maybe Nishiyama, uh, but I think if he really was taught about how Chizuo was taught about how to do this he must have shown it to someone maybe Nishiyama didn't teach him this trick but maybe he taught him something else that's very possible anyways any case yeah like we don't have to we don't have to like imagine just it's just interesting that Nishiyama like at that point in time already thought he knew what was going to happen he sort of had a premonition and it's something we talked about it before in the last episode about being able uh, about when you were reading your friend's script right with the uh, japanese schindler and how in that script you felt like the character already knew that it was the holocaust right yeah and I think yes, it's another it, it's, example. It's a, in, in retrospect yeah. point of view, it was written, right? Knowing what will happen, and they wrote it. But at that point, yeah, nobody was not sure. But in the sense but it was, it could be right. Meaning in the sense that, oh, you know, there's some symptom, right? Of the, what would happen, right? And anyhow. So, and it was over the issue and Chizuo's change in attitude that drove the two men apart. Chizuo began to be more and more comfortable. So when he went to visit Nishiyama, he would ring the boozer and as soon as he was in the door, he would pull a juice out of the fridge and if he washed his face, he would dry his face on Nishiyama's towel. <laughs> it's like a uh, childish, but yeah, and then those things you remember, right? Yeah, it's just these little grating things. Like, 
things a roommate will do, you know? Like, your roommate will leave a fork in the sink, and you'll be like, oh, that asshole. Um, but yeah. it, like, you mean objectively, by, right? yeah, but objectively, there's nothing wrong with it. But, yeah, so basically, Chizuo would overstep <laughs> his boundaries. The last thing to come out of this relationship happened when Nishiyama consulted a fortune teller specializing in names. The specialist wrote up 17 names, and Nishiyama picked Shon. Two other students also picked names, and then Nishiyama offered to let Chizuo pick one from the list. Chizuo looked at the list and said, I'd like to be called Shoko from today onwards. And so he took on the name Shoko Yeah, sounds Matsumoto. similar name, but, you know, and then usually, you know, the, you know, uh, we have a tradition to take one character from your master, right? But the Chinese character is different. And so, uh, Shou Nishiyama is not the guru of uh, uh, Chizou Matsumoto, who became uh, Shoko Asahara later. And the last time they saw each other was in April 1983. On April 5th, 1983, Chizou's third daughter was born. Uh, Nishiyama ordered sushi and they celebrated. For your information, third daughter is uh, called Achari and she has a uh, regard. People think that she has a strong power on the in the Omo now. And uh, she's pretty outspoken. Hmm? And she's in a vice. She's pretty outspoken, and she's in a vice uh, documentary. That's right. And also, she published autobiography recently too, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, after that, uh, uh, after that, Chizo disappeared and called just one time. He called and said, "Sensei, this is Chizuo. Not Shoko this time." And. Uh, Sensei, this is Chizuo. I created a religious group in Shibuya. You know? Wow. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to go back to the name thing. So the specialist wrote up 17 names and Nishiyama picked Shoun. So basically, if what I understand is that the fortune teller created 17 names for Nishiyama and his students, and so they would actually all be related. Is that what you're saying? And so Shon and Shoko is supposed to show a lineage between teacher and student, but Jizuo chose Shoko without taking the exact characters. Is that what I understand? That's correct. He didn't take the same exact character out from the uh, his uh, friend, maybe friend, you know, uh, Shon Nishiyama. Right, but Instead, I think those names were created enough. by the fortune teller. So originally, those names did not have any link, you know, or the same use mm -hmm. didn't use the same character. But for well, Western, originally didn't. Why, why I wanted to tell is for Westerner, they don't have the sense because they don't use the Chinese character, right? I don't know. Do you use the Chinese character if you have a master? You take one letter from your master and then. Or maybe father son relationship too. I don't. No, I think I think the most I think the easiest to understand is actually um, kung fu. Kung fu. Yeah, kung fu. You usually end up taking your master's last name as your own last name, as like your kung fu name. Hmm. One second. I'm just gonna pull it up for you to give you an example. Okay. Okay. Sure. So. Let's see. So Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, Yun Biu, they all they all studied together, right? They were the um, seven little fortunes, and their teacher was named Yu Jim Yun. Let me just call him up. Their teacher's name was Yu Jim Yun. Uh, so what happened was while. While Jackie Chan was training under him, he was known as Yun Lao, right? And Yun Biu is, is, keeps his name Yun Biu, and Sammo Hung also had one of these Yun names. Let me find out what Sammo Hung's is. 
I didn't know that、uh, they, they, take, they take the master's last name. They don't take his last name, they take his given name as a last name. Ah, I yeah, see. So Samu Hung was Yun Long. If my master is Bob Sumith, okay? I become a Atsushi Bob, correct? No? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there are certain rules exactly in how it works. But in this instant, like as an example, this is what happened, right? The guy's name was Yun. And so there's Yun Biu, Yun Long, Yun Lao. And then, and then, of course, later on in their life, they all change their names, right? Like Sing Long, it's not Jackie Chan's name. Yeah, so yeah, we、It's、have. Not his, not his birth name, in right? In Japan,、so. too. We call that、uh, Yo Myo is like、uh, someone like, who became later great. I don't know when they changed the name. They changed the name, right? You know? We, yeah, we, we, when what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, names are really fascinating in Chinese culture, and I think the same in Japanese because people have so many names. They used to have so many names, right? And I think. It's really interesting because they used to have like a name as a baby. They would have like a ch- children's name. They would have a pen name. They would have like names for different stages of their life. And of course, like this tradition is gone now because, because systems can't handle that many name changes. Some people change the name, like a、uh, Buddhist monk. I have a friend, yeah, but legally they change it. They, they pay, they go to the city office, and then you need a very good reason to change the name. That,、uh, otherwise, people, city hall would say no, right? But the monk, my friend monk had a different name, and now his、uh, given name is Shu Zen. I don't know his original name, you know. And his son was born as a、uh, Soichiro. His given name was Soichiro. And uh, now, uh, I don't know, he, he went to City Hall, but at a certain age, he will probably change it to、uh, Shinzen. Right? You see, Shinzen and his father, Shuzen, right? Both, both use the same Chinese character, Zen. That is fully、e- devoting, fully something, you know, fully, right? So, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the、uh, maybe Asian system Us- utilizing the characters, you know? Because character has the meaning, right? You know? So, yeah, that's what it is. And then that was the, yeah, that was the moment that Chizo、uh, became a shoko. But he didn't become a Shoko Asahara yet, right? So he was、uh, now, he is just at the point of in between the Chizo Matsumoto and Shoko Asahara.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, how do you feel about this episode? What have we learned? In, in our life, right? There is no what if, right? But what if Sho Nishiyama hired him as an assistant, okay? And then if he is a good man, he became not to like Chizo, right? He beat <laughs> shit out of.、Uh, are, you saying that, are you saying that in another timeline? He would have become a pretty successful Panchiko management. Oh, maybe, maybe.、Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happened to him. You know what I'm saying? What happened to him? Yeah, or maybe he was beaten up like something in mentally, you know? And、uh, he would have another life. But he would have another life, right? No matter what happened, because that's what. It, Yeah, one of the most important trigger points, right? Maybe, you know what?、Uh, maybe Sho Nishiyama hired him and、uh, Chizo became assistant, right? And then Chizo did bad things. Maybe, you know, I don't know. It is uh, uh, 
maybe Shouni Shiyama sent him to a jail, you know, for whatever the reason. We're, we're, we're not sure. You know, we're not sure. But that was the... I don't know, this is whole episode is like this, but... Yeah, what if? Yeah, because... Uh, okay, so even, even though the... Even if we take what is written uh, s s as uh, being said by Sho Nishiyama, he was the right man, right? But it, but but he didn't know that there was anything to stop yeah, either. Yeah, but uh, there is one But he gave him the idea. That's the weirdest thing, right? He gave him the idea I don't... to start a religion. Hmm. So... I, Which he does, right? Yeah. And you know what? Let me tell you that the moment when I was in the in the subway car, right? Then after I survived, always I felt regret. Why I didn't notice enough that I, I knew this was Serene that I could yell, right? But I... You know what I'm saying? Then that's a sort of a, a started having a full of a sense of guilt, guilty. Probably, yeah, I should have known, and then I could help, I could stop, and I could yell. Then I couldn't do it. But truth is, I don't, I didn't know the truth, right? But I think in the sense that Nishiyama had the same feeling, you know what I'm saying? In retrospect, he wanted to... I don't know, I said, although I said that he was... Uh, in retrospect, more, but... Yeah, he, he's a good man. He must have a, a lot of uh, feeling of the regret and guiltiness. The way we discuss, right? As we leave Shoko Matsumoto today, he started a religious group in Shibuya. He has three daughters, and he's trying to harness his superpowers. Next episode will be starting on the first days of Om Shinrikyo. Please listen and subscribe wherever you listen. Review and ratings helps other people find us. Thank you for listening. Reach out to us on Twitter at Cultleader and me. Thank you.